And we're live. Happy Wednesday and uh, welcome back to Whiteboard Wednesday where we go over your deals and your questions in real time. As people start to drop in, feel free to put your comments in the live chat and we will go over your questions. Now, I am going through a couple questions that we've got on the YouTube channel. And the first one has to do with creative financing. What kind of attorney do you use to put together these seller finance deals? Well, first things first, oh, hello, Dividend Dave. You need a competent real estate attorney that not only has been in the business for a while, but owns the type of real estate that you want to own. It's so important that you work with A players. You can't be working with the C team in this game. So you need to be working with people that number one, I've been in the business for a little bit. It's fun to give new people a shot, but when you're doing your legal docs, you need competent people. So work with people that have been in the game and then work with people that own the type of real estate you want to own and have done the type of deals you want to do. My attorney works out of Olympia. She is baller and she's been in the real estate game for a long time. done a lot of private notes and they own a note servicing company. She knows a thing or two about a thing or two in the real estate game. Hey, we got some more people joining in. We got Jungle Strut, Thinking AI. Hey, everybody. It's good to see you. If you've got some questions for this week, feel free to drop them down below. We were just in Texas. Ramiro Cardenas asked, were you in San Antonio? No, we were in Dallas. So this was the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We were speaking at Michael Blanc's event. And uh, Michael Blanc is a syndicator. He's got a little over 2,000 doors, been playing the game for a while. And so uh, they invited us to come speak down there, talk about how we play the game a little bit less conventionally. And uh, so we, we did that, but we were not in San Antonio. From Thinking AI, how do you finance down payments? Chatted with some private lenders and they said they don't want to be in second lien in a seller property. All right. So financing down payments is with private money and private money just comes from private individuals. It comes from people. So as you build these connections up, you map out their circle drill, you start building rapport and you understand where people want to go. You line up an opportunity where they would be highly interested and it would move their pieces forward. Now you can finance it as debt or you can finance it as equity. Equity does cost you more in the long run as a standard. However, the way we've done it is we have done second lien. If they're not willing to do second lien as a lender, you could look at taking them on as an equity partner with a fixed buyout agreement in your operating agreement. So you have this thing called an OA. It's an operating agreement when you're buying real estate in an LLC. What we do, if we take on an equity partner, we're in essence financing the down payment because they're bringing the money. We're giving them a little bit of equity and we have a fixed buyout agreement to where we can write them a check in the future for X amount. It's fixed. And then they have to give their equity back. So it's similar to a loan, but they're backed by ownership in the asset. Gavin Miller, what is a syndicator? Well, a syndicator is the person who runs the whole syndication. And what a syndication is, is you have an asset you want to buy. Let's say that this is a building and to buy it, you need to put 30% down. So this is the part that you need to get from people and the rest is from a bank. The 30% is going to come from a crowdsourced fund. So basically you're going to go out to the public you're going to get all your filings and then you're going to start marketing to either friends and family or if you file for the right type of syndication then you can just market on social media there's different types of funds different regulations for all of them and so that's where we talked about that first question where do you find a good attorney you need to find someone who's been in the game in that case familiar with the sec regs and uh, it's, it's a completely different animal there's a reason we don't play that game but um, you are basically crowdsourcing all the money. And then you have a, the GP, which is the general partnership, the leaders of that group who makes all the decisions. And then the, the limited partners, the LPs, are the people that put in the money. And their exposure is typically limited to the money that they put in. Jungle Strut. Did Michael Blanc say how they heard about you? Well, I met Michael a few years ago. And uh, then we... It was through online. Then we met up on one of his Zooms. I started uh, meeting up with him in Belize because we were at the Real Estate Guys radio show. They have a they have a resort down over in Belize. And so uh, we met there two years ago in person for the first time, did some content. I spoke at their Dealmaker Live event a year ago. 
And then I just spoke at it with Christian. First time we did something like that together here uh, in Dallas, Fort Worth. But uh, we've known about each other for a little while. From Booker. Best ways to estimate closing costs for seller finance deals. Well, they're not a lot. You got to do the logic test. And the logic test, you got to just play out what costs you're actually going to have. What fees are you going to have? When you do conventional financing, there's not just fees, but there's a fee fee, meaning that the lender is going to charge a fee to give you a fee because they think it takes time to charge you fees. So they're going to find every way to nickel and dime you. So they're financing. That's not the case. Typically, some of the larger costs when you're closing a deal are your loan origination fees, where they're going to charge you money to originate that loan so that the broker can get paid, and, uh, the, the lending officer, so that they can actually get money and live their life. Imagine that. So uh, those don't happen because you don't have a loan broker when you're seller financing. You have an attorney drafting up your docs. That's going to cost a little bit of money. Might cost you 500 bucks, thousand dollars on a, a simple deal. You're going to have your insurance because you're going to have to pay a little bit of that premium up front if you don't pay the whole year in advance. You're going to have title and escrow. If you're in an escrow state, you're going to have attorney's fees to actually get it recorded if you're in an attorney state. And um, other than that, you're going to have your prorated taxes. You're going to have your LLC filings. You're going to have to set up your bank account. So there might be a couple of little fees there. But when I'm buying a seller financed deal, even the Robinhood four and a half million dollar purchase, our closing costs were maybe 10 grand. We've bought a deal that um, my closing costs were a thousand dollars and it was a 12 plex. So uh, it can be very, very small, depending on how you structure your, your deals. Kevin O'Neill, thank you for the super chat. Much appreciated. From Mac. Any idea what to do if you ask an agent if the seller wants to do seller finance and they're not interested because they want to do 1031 to avoid taxes? Well, that would be deferring taxes. If they just want to avoid it altogether, then uh, you could just do a super long amortized loan and that'll reduce their tax obligation over the amount of years that you amortize it over. And as they collect money, they'll pay taxes, but they have a smaller tax bracket because it's an amortized loan versus getting all the cash. So, uh, if they just want to avoid it, I would still put the proposal in front of them. The beauty of sales is you can get everything you want if you ask twice. Most people stop after the first time. You need to keep asking. And sometimes you need to rephrase the question so it lands a little differently. It's one thing to, to get your point across, but it's another thing to get it to be received. And some people are not receiving information the way that you share it. So it's best to take a step back, rephrase it. And then ask that question one more time. How was Texas? Did you miss me not being there? Well, you need to go hang out, Dividend Dave. But uh, Texas was great. It was very warm. I'm trying to get a tan one day at a time. These whiteboard Wednesdays will be less white and there'll be more tan. But uh, no, I'm trying my best. But no, it was a lot of fun. We played cornhole, got to go check out the stockyards. Got to do our presentation. It was just a lot of fun. From Jungle, th thank you for the super chat. How did you raise money for the rehab costs on your $4 million deal? So the $4.5 million deal was the Robin Hood Village Resort. It was, uh, you can check that out, robinhoodvillageresort.com. And uh, that one we bought with zero money out of pocket. The way that we did the rehab on that is out of cash flow. What we do whenever we buy real estate is we get a physical property inspection. We want to get the physical condition of the asset. And uh, on the Robin Hood, we skipped that step because we thought we were smart enough to, to figure that out. But best practice, what we do in all of our apartments is we go in and we get a physical inspection, regardless of whether it's a $4 million deal or a $400,000 deal. And we're going to gauge the quality of the asset. At that point, we can cash flow plan for the projects. What we did on the Robin Hood is we just looked at it ourselves, and there was a few things we missed and that's fine. We didn't know to look for trees that were sick and dying. And so uh, that went above our head and we had to write a check for that. However, we buy based on positive cash flow for equity growth. So when it comes to your rehab costs, you're going to look at an asset and it's either going to be in great condition, um, fixable, or it's going to be in disrepair. 
And that asset was in pretty good condition. And for the things that weren't in great condition, it was fixable. But we buy based on cash flow for equity growth. And if you want to play at the game on the highest level, you do that. You don't just buy for one or the other. So we bought the deal under market value. We know we can get the asset value up when it's stabilized. And on top of that, it cash flowed day one. So we projected that we could do all the little fixes with the cash flow. And for the unexpected fixes, we had enough margin to where we could just write a check out of that building. Now we have had to do a couple owner contributions. We had to uh, write a check. I think we're in at $20,000 for rehab, but we have enough apartments. That's why we built our multifamily strategy based off of stable cash flowing apartments. We have enough cash flow from the rentals to help us write those checks. Always start with the apartments. Okay. When analyzing a property, what are the numbers I need to know and hit? Well, you need to know your income. You need to know your expenses. You need to know what your debt is going to cost, when your debt is coming due. And uh, as, as far as that goes, you should know the economic drivers. So as far as numbers, uh, how many people are employed in any given field and how many different economic fields are there? How many different big employers are there? That matters because if one goes away, do you still have people working that can pay the rent? But on a base level, you should know that what your incomes, expenses, and debt costs are, and at what point that debt will change on you. Hey, Rob made it. Ta-da, you're here. All right, from Gavin, I'm familiar with single family for inspection. I can usually do seven days or less. What's reasonable inspection period and closing time frame for a large multifamily? We just went under contract on a 34 unit, a uh, we're going under contract on a 48 unit. And then there's another one. I should know this a 60 unit over in Walla Walla. And uh, on those deals, we have 30 day timelines for feasibility for standard. So we ask for 30 and we have our timeline start contingent upon receipt of due diligence stocks. So we want to see rent rolls, estoppel letters, cash flow, T12 statements, and uh, then bank statements and leases, of course. Do I offer my proposal to the agent or the owner? Well, if it's listed, they hire an agent to have that barrier separation. So you're going to go through the agent and they will make the presentation to the owner. If you're going direct to owner, you do the Google Maps method that I did, then you can go directly to the owner. But if they hired someone, go through the person they hired. From Apollo, when balloon payment ends, if you refinance with the bank, won't the interest be 2x? Or are there other ways to deal with the balloon payment when it comes to? I'm doing a seller finance deal right now, zero money down, it's going to be at 10%. When I refi, my rate will go down to about six, maybe five and a half, depending on the debt product and the, the time that I take to stabilize this. So it's not necessarily just going to go up. Again, you don't get what's fair, you get what you negotiate. 10% made sense for this deal, so I got 10%. And uh, they weren't willing to go lower. And this, I know this guy, he will not go lower. So if, uh, if you're going to refinance, it doesn't mean that you're going to go up. It doesn't mean you're going to go down. It could stay the same. It could go way up. It depends what you're going from. I know people with 0% interest seller finance notes, their interest rate would go up infinity percent because zero times any number is still zero. So um, it's, it's not an exact ratio there. What are the most common things to increase the value of a property besides increasing NOI? So you can increase the NOI or you can decrease the cap rate. Those are your two options. The cap rate is your multiplier and your net operating income is the, the unit that gets multiplied. So if you increase the dividends of an asset, the net dividends that an investor would get, they can pay more and get the same return that you did when you bought it. So increasing the net dividends, the NOI, that's the cash flow you'd have if you owned it in cash. That will increase the asset value because someone else can come in, pay more for it and get the same return that you did. If you decrease the cap rate, we'll talk about how to do that in a minute. That means that people will expect a lower return when they pay for it. And if you get a lower return, it means you paid more for the asset. So that will actually drive the asset value up. If you want to do that, you need to increase the stability of the asset. And uh, as far as increasing stability, that could be increasing the quality 
It could be fixing up the neighborhood. If you buy the whole neighborhood and fix it all up, we've worked on doing that before. But uh, that whole community needs to be a more stable asset. Could be getting longer term leases, could be getting a better tenant quality by adding amenities. But uh, those are the big ways you do it. You increase the NOI or you lower the cap rate by increasing the stability of the asset. How do you verify rental income? Do you require tax returns, pro formas? Pro formas are projected future value. I don't care about pro formas. That's where a lot of real estate agents live and that's the reason they don't buy a lot of real estate. Pro formas don't mean anything to me. I care about day one. So as far as verifying income, the magical number in accounting is zero. Everything should be able to get back to the number zero because they balance. So when it comes to verifying, I look at bank statements and I look at a cash flow. It's called T12. So it's going to show all income and all expenses. The reason that this matters is if they say there was $7,769 in income in a month, I should be able to track that on the cash flow statement. I should be able to see which tenants paid to add up to that and it should work alongside their leases and it should also be in the bank statements but i, I always require proof i want to look at the bank statements because if they can't prove with bank statements i don't need to buy it from julian hello hello hey all right from jungle what goes into your feasibility other than hiring an inspection so there's a physical inspection with your inspector and then there's going to be your financial due diligence which it's arguably more important, especially when you're getting started. You need income. So what I'm looking at, I want to see a rent roll that's going to show not just the unit and the rent amount. It's going to show the tenant's name, when they moved in, when their lease was from, when it goes to, because now I'm going to see if it's month to month or if it's going on a term lease. I want to see their security deposit, the rental amount. And uh, those are the main ones for a rent roll. It'll show if they're delinquent any or not, and how many times they've not paid or how many times their payments have bounced with an NSF check. On top of that, I want to see the leases. I want to see estoppel letters where the tenant signs saying, this is my rent, this is my deposit. That way it lines up. The tenant is signing saying that, so they can't come back later and say, well, my deposit is X and the, the seller told you it was Y. That's super important. I want to see the cash flow statement and then I want to see three months of bank statements. If all those things line up and everything equals zero, you just take the income less expenses and it always is the same thing, regardless of the bank statement or the cash flow statement. The rent rolls match the stop the letters, which match the leases. Then I'm usually pretty content. Are you going to Grant Cardone's December real estate networking summit? Probably not. I don't even, I haven't even heard of that one yet. So I don't think I will be there from Jace. Cody, do you ever use subject to finance strategy? If yes, how did you find a real estate attorney who's creative finance friendly? Subject to is a poor business model. It is a strategy to buy real estate. However, if you just focus on that, you will buy very, very little. We did a subject to clause on the Robin hood. For one of the cabins, one of the cabins had underlying debt on it. So we did a uh, seller finance note for a portion, the large portion, which actually conveyed title. We did a real estate contract, which gave us equitable title and the, the seller retained legal title on one of the cabins, which had a subject to clause so they could keep their mortgage in place. Lots of ways to play the game, but uh, we always advise you don't just build your strategy or build your business off of one of those strategies because that'll keep you thinking small. As far as finding the real estate attorney, the real estate attorney we got introduced to by the owner of the resort, the prior ownership. And she is actually really awesome at what she does. She's been in the game for a long time, knows what she's doing. And she helps us on a lot of our creative plays today. But again, people that own real estate know people that own real estate and people that have been playing the game for a while have the connections that you probably want. Also, we've got 17 people in the chat and four likes. If you would help us out with that ratio, that would be phenomenal. That does help our channel. What's the oldest building you would purchase? Well, I have two questions. How do I buy it? How do I never lose it? So if you're going to go into it, even if it was built in 1910 or 1900, 
if it was newly renovated 10 years ago, 20 years ago, then I don't care that it was built in the early 1900s. It's very deal specific and that is uh, up to you, but I would buy something in the early 1900s all day long. I have a lot of stuff from the 50s. I've got some stuff from the 90s, from the early 2000s. I love it all equally. I'm Luigi said, hey, how's it going? It's going well. Good to see you. From Rob, when negotiating a balloon at X number of years in the future, are you basing X on an expected future interest rate? Or is it a time window which you expect to reduce the debt? So it is definitely not predicting an interest rate. That would be a good way to, to build a business that fails. There's five metrics in real estate. People usually talk about four of them, but you've got cash flow, appreciation, depreciation, which is just debt reduction. Uh, I mean, uh, that's just a tax write off. And then you got debt reduction. Those are the four people talk about. You get cash flow, monthly cash flow coming in, new income. You got appreciation where your assets going up, depreciation where you're getting these tax write offs for the wear and tear on your asset, and debt reduction where your debt's getting paid down through amortized loans if you're doing those. The fifth one, which is what we're going to talk about for this question, is debt devaluation. Every day the government prints more money. And when you add new supply, it devalues the current supply. So the thought process is, I am taking calculated bets with other people's money, aka debt, against the government's ability to manage money effectively. And so that is what Chris and I do. So when we're buying cash flowing assets that go up in value, they're not going in up in value typically because they're actually worth more. The reason it goes up is because the debt's getting devalued by the government printing more money. And when they print more money, that devalues the debt that we have on the asset because the NOI artificially goes up because there's more money supply. So the rents do go up over time because of that. It's not because they're actually worth more. There's just more money out there. So the rents go up, which boosts the NOI, which boosts the value, but the debt stayed the same or it went down. So if you're amortizing it, it went down a little bit, but either way, that debt stack is worth less. The payments are identical and the new net income is higher. So your cash flow goes up. So we do 10, 15, 20, 30 years because I know for a fact the government will abuse their ability uh, to effectively manage money by printing more of it to bail them out of their own problems, which in turn bails out everybody that has debt. It's the reason they do it. So uh, that's the reason we borrow. And that's the reason we say long term fixed rate mortgages, because your NOI will just go up if you're buying in uh, growing areas. I'm not just saying growing areas just because they're growing, but just because they're not dying, you're either expanding or contracting. So I don't want to buy in a ghost town, but as long as the, the area you're buying in is here in 20, 30 years, there will be a lot more money in circulation. And as long as there's people living there, you will get all that extra money. Does the Robin Hood Resort have a game room? Yes, it does. And uh, we had a poker night there the other night uh, when we did our last event. But yes, it absolutely has a game room and it's got a little bar area. Oh yeah, Rob said, yes, Dave, it's called the water. Yes, you can also play games in the water. What are some property value or some property improvements that can increase value the most? Those covered parking help. I don't have any assets with covered parking. I, I don't think, well, I do. I have some assets, um, I've got a handful of them that have garages, which are definitely a plus. But I found most people just use garages as storage. So I don't know how much I could actually attribute to that as um, value. But when it comes to increasing value, uh, redoing the exteriors is huge. But I've found we did the 38 plex. We started redoing the interiors first. We kept the outside ugly because that kept our property taxes down, which helped us on the cash flow front. And then when we got the insides nicer, got them rented out to where we had more cash flow, we decked out the exterior with a six figure remodel, multiple six figure remodel. We did that on a refinance. And uh, that will lower our cap rate because the asset quality went up significantly. We're fixing the landscaping. We took concrete block buildings to really nice siding, redid the windows, did security, uh, redid all the trim, the paint, the doors. So we just increased the quality of the asset overall, which is lowering our cap rate and increasing our asset value. But we always start by doing the interiors first, and then we'll do the exteriors second. Have you ever done a deal 
where he did not work with a real estate lawyer? Uh, no, not really, because you're going to need an attorney to draft up your promissory note and your deed of trust. Do not use boilerplate templates on the internet. That is a poor business model. Google is not your lawyer. Neither am I, but uh, Google is not your lawyer. So don't use the, the boilerplate docs. Use a competent attorney every single time. That's what we do. Do you have to sign an NDA to view all the income and expense documents? I never sign NDAs ever. And uh, I just leave it at that. I don't sign them. From Muhammad, how much harder is it to get a creative finance deal on a newly listed property? It's, I wouldn't say it's that much harder. Brokers want to get paid. If you show them a quick path to get them money in their pocket, they will absolutely do it. You just have to keep it simple. There was a deal that got listed in Union uh, next to our resort. And we bought the resort and it got listed. And then we bought the property about a month later. But I called them up. It was listed with conventional cash out. And I just said, hey, would you hold the contract? They said, no, we have debt. And then they called me back and said, you know what? We're just going to pay it off. You never know what position that they are in. They may just be affluent enough to write a check and get out of the property. So you just have to ask the question and keep it simple. Did you meet Christian at 10X Growth Conference? We started building our connection, our relationship on the business level at 10X. However, we worked in the same office building in a little area in Tacoma prior to that. We ended up going to the, uh, the Growth Conference together, and then that's where we started working together. Is it possible for a seller who owner financed a property to a buyer to still benefit from yearly depreciation of the asset? I don't think so. I'm not, uh, I don't think I'm qualified to really answer that question because I'm not a tax person. However, if they're not the owner, then they're probably just logic test, probably not getting the, the write-offs an owner would. They're not going to receive all their money up front, so they're not going to have a cap gains on everything potentially. However, uh, for the actual depreciation, I don't see why they would get that. That'd be a really good question for your CPA. For my Apple ID, I'll give you a like if you can explain the difference between pre-stabilized and stabilized. Absolutely. Appreciate that. I will take the like. When you're going to stabilization, that is stage number two in our business cycle. You have build phase, stabilization, optimization, and debt hammer, where you actually pay off all your loans. Imagine that. That's against the grain. When you're building your organization, your company, you're buying up everything that fits your criteria. That is pre-stabilization. Stabilization just means you have consistency. You have consistent income, consistent expenses, and uh, you may still have some capital expenditures you got to do in the future, but everything is just ordinary income and expenses. There's nothing out of the ordinary. Optimization, you've gone to highest and best use. You've eliminated the capital expenditures by knocking them out and you've got the highest rents with the lowest expenses before you go in and stabilize an asset you have to buy it and get your portfolio to a point where you can afford to renovate it with cash or cash flow because you do have to renovate things with money so uh, pre-stabilized you don't have consistent income and expenses you're still figuring out you don't really know yet what all the expenses are going to be in theory you know because they gave you a spreadsheet but you bought it you have to prove it for yourself expenses are going to go up with taxes insurance utilities so you're going to get a gist of everything that's going on at that point when that is stabilized it's going to take about 18 months on a multifamily asset to get it truly stabilized is what we found if you're doing a a, a flip project where you're going in and doing a bunch of renos within 18 months you should be able to have a fully stabilized asset with consistent income and consistent expenses. Does a purchase have to be a value add? Absolutely not. How do you buy it? How do you never lose it are the criteria that we care about. How do you buy it? You line up your deal, your debt, and then your equity down, which could also be another form of debt. And then uh, when it comes to never losing it, long-term fixed rate debt, cash flow, and margin. Now we say, how do you never lose it? There's no guarantee in investing, but the way that an ideal situation 
you're not losing your real estate. And the best way to manage that is long-term fixed rate debt or no debt, but that's not realistic for most people. Cash flow and margin. You control your variables and uh, you have extra margin above and beyond your mortgage. We bought turnkey deals where the rents couldn't go up, but it added cash flow to our universe. It's hard to go broke if you have long-term fixed rate debt and you just keep adding extra cash flow to your bank account every single month. My biggest difficulty is approaching the agents with the creative finance deal. Any tips? Keep it simple. When I make the pitch, I'm not asking, are you guys open to terms? Are you open to creatively financing this? That is not the way you do that. That screams I don't have any money. And it's okay if you don't have any money. But it's not okay to sound like you don't have any money because then they're not going to want to work with you. So the way that I ask when I ask, which is at the end of the conversation, is would they be open to holding a contract? And then I zip it. Less is more. Don't try and justify your pitch. That makes you a weak negotiator. Just ask the question and then stop talking. Did you say update interiors first and keep exterior the same to keep assessment low? That is what I said. That's what I did on all my assets. I upgraded the interiors. So I upgraded the quality of living that my tenants would get first. I kept the outsides very ugly. I learned this from a property owner who owned a fiveplex next to me. He said, Cody, your taxes will go up if you spend 200 grand to make this nicer, but your rents won't go up right away unless you show love to the inside of these units. So what you should do is you should, and this is just the advice I got from an owner. You should go in and make the interiors nicer. You're going to get a nice quality tenant. It won't be the top tier yet because the exterior of the building is still ugly, but you're going to get people that will care for the units more so than when they were trashed. So you upgrade the interiors, get the rents up a little bit. After you do that, you get it stabilized. Then you can go do the exterior of the asset. Now you can get a higher quality of tenant or you can keep the people that are in there. They'll pay a little higher rent and they'll appreciate it more. At that point, your taxes will go up because when you make something nicer, it's worth more. And when it's worth more, the government's going to take more money from you. They don't really incentivize you to, to be a good landlord, but uh, that is just how the system works. So I upgrade the exteriors last so that I can save on property taxes in the meantime. Because in the beginning, every dollar matters. From Troy, do you recommend a good lawyer? And how did you find a real minded lawyer? I'm going to assume that meant real estate. Uh, I do have a good lawyer. You can text me. I'm not going to put them on blast because then we'll never have time for me. But uh, you can text me directly. I know you have my number. And um, then uh, I can send you their information. As far as finding them, you got to work with people that are in the game at a higher level than you are because they have better connections than you do more often than not. When you are doing the debt hammer pay down, is that for mainly the capital debt or the mortgage debt or both? That is for both. You start by paying down the investors. You want to buy them out as quickly as possible. That's the model that we have. Give your investors their money back first. Whoever has the most money in a deal holds the most risk. They're holding the bag. So I let the lender hold the risk until the very last minute. So I want to get my uh, investors paid out first if I have investors on a deal. Sometimes it's just us. But when we have investors, get them their money so that they're good. You always take care of the investors. For the You always have to pay the mortgage payment first, but you always want to take care of the investors on their payouts first, like for just writing a check. After we buy the investors, then we go into the debt hammer mode. Because optimization is also getting rid of your expenses and investors can be an expense. So uh, buying them out, getting them a good return on their money. And that's why we do our buyout agreements that are fixed. So we can write a check. When they're gone, we're optimized. Then we go to debt hammer mode and we'll just start writing a check for the debt on the asset. Okay, the, let's see. I lost my place. Oh, there we go. If the seller has a, a percent of debt, high or low on the, the current property, is there still a way to sell or finance the property? There is. Best practice is always free and clear title, meaning there's no liens against the asset. Now, that is a best practice that is all not always realistic. So uh, when it comes to buying real estate that is encumbered, you can't assume that obligation and have some sort of real estate contract for the difference. 
but that is really the, the main way to do it. Or you can have a lender come in first position and have the seller go into second position, get a private loan to take it out, have the seller go into second, get the value up and refinance and pay them both out. But typically on that type of deal, the seller will have to finance in second lien. And if they truly believe their asset is worth what it is worth, then they will do that. If they think they're overselling it to you, overpricing it, then they typically won't because then they're not backed by enough equity. It's a good way to weed out the people that are trying to steal from you too by selling you something too expensive. All right. To the question, are you open to a contract? What do you typically say if they say no? Or what is that? How do you approach that? If they say no, again, the rule of sales, you always have to ask twice. I would just acknowledge it, say, okay, well, this is how I, I saw this deal playing out. And then I would list my terms. I was hoping to give them, if it's a $2 million deal, I was hoping to give them 400 grand down, then hold a contract for four years at 3% IO or whatever your terms, 10 years at 5%. I tell them how I see things playing out because when you give them a roadmap, it gives them something they can share with the seller. If you just say, okay, you put your hands down, the next person who pitches it, the, the agent's gonna say, huh, I keep hearing this. Maybe I should relay this to the seller. You need to ask twice. And if you, in this case, ask twice in the form of telling them how it will play out, they have something real they can present to the seller. And um, that is how I get my deals accepted more often than not. Keep pursuing it. If they say, what is that? Then again, you go through the same talk track. Well, this is what I saw playing out. I give them 400 grand. They'd hold a note for the rest at 5% for 10 years. And then you let them talk. Is this live going to be posted? Absolutely. Every single Wednesday, except for last Wednesday. I don't remember what we were doing. Oh, we were in Texas last Wednesday. We couldn't make it. That was on us, but this will be posted every Wednesday that we go live. They do get posted. How do you work a seller finance deal with a seller that has debt and multiple multifamily properties, duplexes in a portfolio? You can buy, and we're doing this actively on a deal in Walla Walla. You can do a conventional purchase and seller finance the rest. Example, let's say you're buying a portfolio of 10 duplexes and four of them have debt, but it's under one LLC. You could do four of the duplexes conventionally. So if each duplex is worth maybe 200 grand, you're buying 10 of them, then that's a $2 million deal. You're buying four duplexes for 800,000. So you'd have to come up with $200,000, 25% down to buy the four duplexes. They could sell or finance the other six for 1.2 million, zero down on the seller finance note. So you'd be coming in buying it for 200 grand which is 10% down of the 2 million, but 25% of the conventional deal. And the bank is going to come up with the other 600,000 for those four duplexes, the conventional part. So they're essentially getting $800,000, but you're only coming out of pocket $200,000. So it's deal debt equity. It's not always just the seller finance piece. You can come in with external debt for a portion. It's very easy to do that on those portfolios like you're talking about. From Kevin. I don't own any real estate. I found a building listed on LoopNet that looks like it would cash flow. I'm not 100% confident in my ability to calculate that. What are my next steps? You're going to get out a piece of paper. You're going to write down the income of the asset, the property expenses. And then you're going to have this thing called NOI, your gross scheduled income, less your operating expenses, your taxes, insurance, utilities, maintenance, management, prepared, all the, those items, not including debt the actual expenses to keep the operate or the, uh, the property afloat, you subtract those out from the rental income on an annual basis. And you're gonna have this thing called NOI, your net operating income, less your mortgage equals your cash flow. You want that to be as positive as possible. So you're just going to have to underwrite that deal. It's a simple one page spreadsheet that you can build out to take it slow. Total income less total operating expenses equals NOI, NOI less your mortgage equals cash flow. If you're happy with that amount, then you can proceed. If not, then you go find another deal. But that is the way you're going to do it. How many people do you currently have in your weekly mentorship program? Depending on the day, we typically have anywhere from 30 to 45 people. That is seems to be the average. Thursdays, which is tomorrow, 
Thursday is 10 a.m. Pacific. It's just a different time. It is also recorded. But we usually have 20 to 30 people on that because it's just a different time for people. But we've got folks all the way over in uh, the UK and we've had people in Africa and Australia. So they're in a different time zone completely. So we have this just so people can jump in at their convenience. But uh, anywhere from on Thursdays, 20 to 30 and on the main days, 30 to 35, 45 people on average. Thinking AI, is there a free forum you have like a Discord or Facebook page? We have a multifamily strategy Facebook page. And uh, other than that, I don't even know what a Discord is. I haven't figured that out. I'm not a very tech savvy guy and I've never looked into it. So if you want to teach me how, maybe we could set that up. Do I offer the agent or seller a regular deal below the asking price before I mention if they're willing to go under a contract well you have to have your deal your debt and your equity lined up before you buy a piece of real estate so if you have the deal it's phenomenal but before you make an offer for a price you have to have an idea of what your debt looks like otherwise you're making an uneducated offer that you probably can't close on so i would make the proposal first of them holding a contract at specific terms because until you know your debt cost you don't know your cash flow and until you know your cash flow, you have no business buying real estate because you live and die by cash flow when it comes to running a business. How would you use the seller's equity to finance the deal? I'll give you an example. I'm doing a deal right now, 34 units, buying it in central Washington. The seller owns it in cash. I have a hard money lender financing a million two seven five of the purchase. I'm buying it for a million seven. The seller is financing 425. He owns in cash. He can do whatever he wants with his equity. So he's financing the down payment as a lien against another asset. And so I get hundred percent financing. One's private money. One is the seller's equity. That's one way you could do it where they finance the down payment, second lien position. Another way they could do it is they could just finance the whole thing. There's no due on sale clause for their mortgage if they have no mortgage. So they can do what they want. They can write a promissory note backed by their equity, whatever they want to do. You get what you negotiate, not what is fair. So you just have to ask and put a proposal in front of people and keep it simple. Keep in mind, if you are borrowing the capital, you need to ideally make sure the cash flow can pay for the capital debt. Absolutely. You pay for debt and you pay for people and you pay for bills with money. You want people working on your team it costs money the money does have to come from somewhere so uh, you do have to allocate for that if you're raising money all right thoughts on bigger pockets bigger pockets is a corporately owned company and they're changing but it seems like a good platform to connect with people i've been on that it was actually their most watched youtube podcast which is kind of fun it's going to get close to a million two views here in a little bit, but uh, it's a great platform to meet people, hear stories, and it doesn't cost you a dime for the YouTube portion anyway. Where can we hit you up or DM you? I can help you set up a Discord. It helps a lot having one. If you want to send a message to Christian on Instagram, his Instagram is at Christian Osgood then you can absolutely do that. And we can chat about getting one set up because I have no idea how to do that. Other than that, we are out of questions. So if anybody has any more questions, I will wait. And if not, then we will go uh, from there. When did you start with your creative finance journey? So October of 2019, about my first 12 flex. And that was over in central Washington, zero money down, first lien, second lien, the first lien was seller financed, 30 year AM, no balloon, 6% interest. And it was on the market for 551 days. The second lien was 12% interest for one year. And it was interest only when I couldn't make the payment at the one year, I had to pay for an extension for one more year and I paid it off within that second year. If the seller takes second lien position, does the deed still get transferred to your name? So it depends what type of state you're in. 
but I'm operating out of the knowledge base of Washington. You have title and lien holders or your lenders cloud that title. So they're putting uh, an encumbrance against the title and you hold the title, but it's encumbered by all these debts. So you can't give that title to anybody else without paying off the people that hold liens against it. So you would own it, even if there's a second, even if there's a third, but you've got a lot of encumbrances to pay off before you can ever go sell that. So just keep that in mind. From Jungle, thank you for being so generous with your knowledge and experience, Cody. Hey, I appreciate that. And uh, really do thank you for being here. We appreciate the support. Christian hasn't been on uh, the last couple of calls because he's been super busy with the portfolio, but uh, he appreciates everybody being here just as much as I do. Happy to help. Are taxes generally included in operating costs when calculating NOI? Your property taxes are absolutely included when calculating your NOI. How would you invest half a million into real estate? Well, for me, half a million dollars buys about $5 million of real estate. And I'd be buying a value add deal. So what I would opt to do with half a million is buy a $4 million deal, 10% down. I would find a value add opportunity on that. Maybe that's a 40 unit buying for hundred grand a door. I'd find a way to get that from a hundred grand a door to a buck 25, pick up 25,000 a door on 40 units. So you turn your, your 400 into a million four. There are doable deals like that in every market in the United States. Uh, you can absolutely find a hundred grand a door in every state in the U S at least today. And, uh, Turn the, million, the 400 grand to a million four, still have your 100,000 in the bank for reserves. So triple your money effectively. Half a million goes into a million five and then rinse and repeat. But that is what I would do with half a million bucks. Thoughts on using creative financing for Section 8 investments? Absolutely. You can absolutely do that. I've got a couple Section 8 tenants. Regardless of where people are at in their life cycle, people need a place to live and they need a quality place to live. If uh, you don't fix up the, the slums that a lot of Section 8 people are living in, then they'll just be slums and they'll get degraded. And then there will be that stigma forever around Section 8. So we are a firm believer of providing a great place to stay for everybody. And uh, whether they're Section 8 or not, they do need a place to live. I think we've got maybe five people on Section 8 in the portfolio today. What's your biggest red flag when evaluating the physical portion of a property and the financial portion? Well, red flag for the financial is the numbers don't add up with the bank statements, the cash flow statements, the leases, the stop letters, and the rent rolls. If they don't add up, then they're lying. That is just a fact. It's not like they're that unorganized, they're just lying. As far as the physical portion, if there's a bunch of stuff that's been uh, slapped together, then you can have a lot of costs in the future, which you may not be able to afford. So I would want to see if things were permitted, if they were done correctly and uh, up to code. Do you have a note servicing company you recommend? I use OPT. They're here in Washington. I think they're just in Washington, but I don't know that for a fact, but I, I've worked with them for a lot of my notes. What is the value of your mentorship program with 30 to 40 people on the call? How is that the mentorship that helps wait with 30 to 40 people on the call? How is it that the mentorship helps everyone in their individual deals? Got it. Monday is Q and a day. We go over your questions live. People do the little hand emoji and uh, then they ask their questions. We record all the calls. Now we didn't used to record Mondays because we don't want people to be nervous about their questions. Now we're just saying, grow up and ask your questions but you get to learn from what other people are working on in real time. That is just a very interactive Q and a, and everybody has time to ask their questions if they uh, want to, but about half the people don't, they just listen to other people's difficulties and learn from that. Tuesday is deal deep dive. The reason we position it this way is you get to ask questions that could directly relate to the deals that you're going to pitch present, and we're going to underwrite on Tuesday so that you have quality deals instead of, bad opportunities that are not worth everybody's time. You can bring your deal. We'll underwrite it. Again, a lot of people are shy for the first few weeks and after they get over that, then they pitch your deal, but it is interactive 
and there's a lot of people playing at very different levels. We used to do one-on-one, -on -one, and then we realized that people weren't buying as much real estate as they should be. So group setting opened up a lot of new opportunities. Thursday is a structured lesson, where regardless of the amount of people that are on there, we are teaching a lesson, and it's every single Thursday. So that is not as interactive, but there are people there, and you can do Q&A when it's done. So we found that with 30 to 40 people on these calls, there is a good diverse group of uh, individuals, deals, and uh, backgrounds to where people can get a lot of stuff done. In your opinion, is it better to finish all the coursework in your mentorship program before starting the coaching calls? Completely up to you. If you have the time, then I would jump into it. I didn't have this, but I would have been able to go faster with it. You don't need the mentorship. The information is very helpful. Uh, the practical application is vital, but uh, that is absolutely up to you. I've urged people to do both, and the people that jump all in and are on all the calls tend to do better than those who aren't. When cold contacting an off-market property, what do you say to get an initial meeting? Well, you have to, number one, identify your circle drill. We talk about this on the YouTube channel and in the course, but you have relatable points in sector number one. That's your past. People relate to you based on your past. And you've got goals, which are your future. That's where you're going. So in one hand, you got where you're coming from. The other, you got where you're going. Significance is not your why, but it is what changes for you when you hit your goals. And that creates buying. Now, when I'm making a cold call, you need to establish quickly a relatable point. You have to, before that, establish the reason that you called them. So I'm typically calling on a property. And so if I'm calling on a, a 12 plex, I got, this is what I did on a Marina Drive 12 plex, but I called them up, say, hey, I saw you had a 12 plex over here on Marina Drive. Typically, people are going to say, I'm not selling. I don't know how I'd buy it. I don't have any money. I'm trying to get into the game. Well, that's a relatable point because that's where I'm coming from. That's where most people start from and they can relate to that. So why are you calling? Well, I'm trying to figure out how to play this game. I saw you had a 12 plex. I haven't gone that big. I bought a duplex and I'm looking to scale. Can we grab coffee? And it's not that fast, but it's close when you're making that cold call. So you, you share reason for your call, a relatable point, your goal. I want to scale up similar to how you did it. And then uh, you're closing out by trying to ask for the meeting and then you get off the phone. And that's why I do the coffee meeting because it's easy to ask for. I'll buy them coffee. I just want to learn how they play the game. And that's how I start cultivating that relationship. Julian, how's the gymnastics calisthenics going? It's going. I've lost quite a bit of weight. I've been sticking with it, eating good and, and training weekly. And I'm doing the weight training every single day. So that's been a lot of fun doing uh, gymnastics and calisthenics about twice a week. So getting back into it. Kevin said, thank you, Cody. Really appreciate the whiteboard Wednesdays. Hey, that's awesome. Happy for you. From Muhammad, I just turned 19 and have a lot of risking room. I am too nervous picking up the phone. Look, that's okay. Do it anyways. What if they say no? What if they laugh at you? Then uh, you're going to learn from it. Problem is, today I found that a lot of people get too nervous that they let that stop them from doing what they know is the right thing to do. Regardless of how scary it is, if it's the right thing to do, you better opt to do it. And I found that that has served myself well, that served Christian really well, and uh, it's moved us forward relatively quickly to where we could be had we let our fears get in the way. Being afraid is not a reason not to make the phone call. How do you screen general contractors? Give, I give them a small job, see how they do. And if their work merits doing a little bigger job, then we'll work them up. But that's how I've done it. And if I lose a few thousand bucks over it, then I lose a few thousand bucks and that is what it is. You don't get the best contacts. I'll just share this. You don't get the best contacts until you get to bigger numbers, bigger deals, economies of scale, and you have to fumble your way through business. Unless you have someone you trust exclusively and explicitly in the beginning, maybe their family or maybe their friends. 
unless you have that, then you typically have to fumble through a lot of bad ones to get to the good ones. That's how it was for us. How did you determine using a property manager versus hiring a team? Well, I property managed my first 30 rentals and then Chris and I built a PM company of which I eventually sold out of to him. That's why he's not always on these calls and I am, but, uh, in the beginning, you can self-manage or you can hire a team of professional management. I would recommend you self-manage your first 10 rentals, your units. And after that, then you know what you're doing to some extent and you can put in a professional PM. Until that point, I would self-manage. It doesn't take you as much as, as you think. And if you don't believe me, check out Dion's channel. Dion McNeely he talks about financial freedom, the lazy way. And he does have a YouTube channel. And uh, he's actually comparable size to us, but he does all the self-management with less than two hours a month. So he's very good at what he does. All right. To find apartment complexes that I want to target, I'm using PropStream. What are your thoughts on this? I use Google Maps. You can use PropStream. If that's free, that's great. I, uh, I did not have any money for any of those softwares. So I just use Google Maps. but uh, we have a video on how to find owners through Google Maps for free and find their contact information that's on our page, how to find any contact owner ever, about eight and a half minutes. If PropStream works for you, that's awesome. I just, I never knew about it and I didn't have money for programs, so I didn't do that. Do you recommend your first investment property being out of state if you found the right property? How do you buy it? How do you never lose it? If you can answer those two questions, go for it. The problem with out of state in the beginning is typically people are not buying big enough to warrant the risk of owning. It does not make enough money. If everything worked exactly perfectly, did you build the business you wanted to build? And most people can't say yes. If everything worked perfectly on your out of state, single family, $40,000 rental property, and you paid it off, you may make 70 or uh, 700 bucks a month net maybe so you might make eight grand a year but eight grand a year doesn't buy you the freedom you need at least i, I don't imagine it would. maybe it would if you're in a different country but you get the idea you've got to build something bigger so just make sure if you're doing that how do you buy it how do you never lose it and make sure that you are buying big enough to where you have a payoff someday that's worth all the time you're putting into it let's see when looking at an on market investment, how do you go about comping it to see if it's worth pursuing depending on list price? Price is only an issue in the absence of value. If you don't have any money, price should not be your first focus. You should get value in your terms. If you have no money, you need to figure out where the debt's coming from. And if you have no money, no credit, no experience, your debt, the easiest debt to get is your seller finance debt in most cases so that the seller note you're just going to have to write the note at whatever price they're asking long term to where the price is irrelevant and fixed rate so the variables don't change and low enough interest rate to where you cash flow but that is what i would focus on rather than the price especially when getting started do you have any local students in your mentorship coaching calls if so are they given an opportunity to meet with you? We can always meet for coffee. You just have to ask. We do have some people local to us, some people in Olympia, Tacoma, Renton, north of us. We've had some people in, uh, I think it's Arlington. That's north of us. But uh, anytime you want to grab coffee, you just got to text, ask us. From Yi Yi, let's see. Cody, I recall you mentioned DSCR loans are the worst product. Any reason you do not like them? Uh, I mean, they're not the worst product, but they're not a good loan product. There's a lot of better options. DSCR loans just are not phenomenal products. You're going to have a higher interest rate. You can get a long-term fixed rate mortgage, but I, I just see better debt options that cost significantly less on an interest rate basis than a, a debt coverage ratio loan. How do you get around high prices for five units plus like here in central Florida to make a cash flow? Well, there's only four ways to increase your cash flow. 
And there's two categories and that's it. Anybody that tells you otherwise is wrong. You can optimize the real estate or you can optimize the debt. Optimizing the real estate is not a day one play, but uh, the way that you do that is you can increase the income or you can decrease the expenses. It's the only two in that category. Then you can optimize the debt. You can borrow less money, which means you get a better price or you put more money down, or you can borrow cheaper money, to get a lower cumulative cost of capital. That could be by changing the amortization uh, or just getting a better interest rate. But there's only so far, you can only go to zero. So you can't just ridiculously overpay for something. So uh, you just have to do one of those four things to make your deal work. And if you can't get those four things, you move on to a new deal. What's an unexpected expense that always comes up during rehab and or ownership that affects cash flow, but newbies like myself wouldn't think to factor in? You should get your sewers scoped. You should look at your trees on site if you're buying a bigger property with some acreage. I didn't know to look for trees being sick. And we had a $15,000 tree bill at the, the Robin Hood. And it is what it is. But uh, I would look for those things first. And then uh, your typical inspection will look at the electrical and the plumbing. But make sure you're doing a sewer scope. Checking out the quality of the roof and um, doing good due diligence on the financials because that'll hurt you more than anything. It's what we found that uh, if, if you don't do good due diligence on financials, you may not be collecting as much rent as you think. And then it's really hard to, to cash flow your mortgage. Where are you based out of? Seattle. Wish I wasn't. Seattle is a little rough. Do you know anyone who's currently investing into America from Canada that I can get in touch with? I've got some people on my phone. You can text me and then uh, we can connect on that. How did you go about acquiring private money lending for your deals? Asking a lot of people in the space. You just have to ask. So many people forget that stuff. Just ask the people who own real estate in the area you want to buy in. In a weird spot where I'm at 21 units, but having a poor experience with property management companies, excited for mentorship, just joined. Hey, that's awesome. Excited to see you there. Good job on the 21 units. You're going to have to scale to get better luck with PM. But uh, if you're in Washington, Christian's team can help you out. If not, then uh, it is a little tough with that size portfolio. It helps to scale. So you, you have to swim through it in the meantime. And uh, maybe you self-manage, but it, it gets easier as you scale bigger. What's the legality behind having tenants vacate the property in order to do renovations? Does that have to be underwritten in the contract? Well, if you have to post notices to get tenants out, it's going to highly depend on what state you're in. So you're going to have to talk with a local attorney because I don't know what state you're in or what the laws are where you're at, but there are some states where you can't evict someone based on the time of year because it's too cold outside. That, that's real. Like there are certain months in certain states where you can't evict people because it's too cold. So it's going to highly depend on where you're at. Should I pay for an inspection before buying a property? I would. Best practice, you should have a professional tell you what you don't know. But that is completely up to you. A property inspection that you pay for will look at all the stuff, won't they? The trees too, hopefully. Typically, they're not looking at the trees. For A property inspector is going to look at the building because they're a building inspector. You can hire an arborist to, to go maybe get a core sample out of a tree, but you have to hire the people that are professionals to that space. That is just best practice. How about if you can't find any deals that actually cash flow? Well, if you can't find any deals of cash flow, you have to do one of those four things. You can either uh, increase the income or decrease expenses. Can't do that day one, so that's out immediately. So you have to borrow cheaper money or borrow less money. Those are your only options. If you can't get that negotiated, then you do have to move on to a new deal. Any tips on scaling, growing single family portfolios? Uh, no. I don't because I don't play that game. I don't recommend playing that game. That uh, that would be a different channel. From William, 
How would you recommend talking to brokers out of state and building a relationship since meeting them for coffee isn't possible as frequently? Well, just a cold call. You can hop on a Zoom call. Let them know who you are, what you're trying to accomplish, especially if we're working with brokers. That's what Caleb did in uh, the mentorship. And he, he's up to 28 rentals over in Texas. So you can absolutely do it over the phone, but it's going to be a lot more phone calls. What's been your experience with acquiring insurance companies uh, for your properties? Do you have any recommendations? I work with American Family, but what I started with was a small company and then another company called me up and offered me better coverage for less. And so I went with them and then AmFam called me up and offered me better coverage for less and no one's beat them. And so I stuck with them, but you can switch your policies later. Just make sure you have solid coverage. You have to insure at, I mean, you should insure at replacement costs. You shouldn't typically insure what you buy it at because typically if you're doing good deals, you're buying below replacement cost. Kevin, did Caleb look at all in San, in San Diego? Or he just went straight to, well, he didn't go straight to Texas. I think he started in Nevada. And then when that he found out there was no deals trading there, he went to Texas. But he definitely didn't look in Cali. Would you recommend still acquiring new deals while trying to stabilize existing properties? Is this something that would be better with a partner? I've enjoyed having a partnership. And uh, it makes a lot more things possible. We are still buying while stabilizing the existing stuff. Not necessarily a best practice. We get in cash crunches sometimes. Uh, we always bail ourselves out because we start with cash flow. But when you're always buying, it does keep you very broke. And so if you don't have good lending connections, it can be tough to stabilize your universe. How do you pay yourself with money? <laughs> Just kidding. Where's the money come from, though? We have enough cash flow from the real estate to live indefinitely. And we're not rolling it back into the real estate. So we live very, 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 very broke. It's a lot of varies, but we live with no money. Uh, we, we scrape by. And then when we need cash, we'll do a little distribution out of the real estate and then scrape by. And we need more cash to do distribution. And we will put ourselves on $10,000 a month this year out of the real estate every single month. And we spend less than half of that to live. So we can, we being Christian, I, so we'll each get 10. And they can live on that. I can live on that and save on that. Uh, but in the beginning, you typically just scrape by as an entrepreneur until you don't have to. So that's what we're doing. That's why I'm sitting in a camping chair and I have no furniture in my apartment. But um, that is what it is. Scrape by with the bare minimum and the bare essentials. And one day you won't have to. I'm already an investor with a small single family portfolio. What's the best way to pivot to multifamily? Start buying multifamily. Prove concept first, buy a multifamily rental, prove it that you like it, that you can manage it. And then I would transfer the singles into the multis if that is your goal. And with that, we are in hour 10. I have no more questions. So I will see everybody next week. If you have any more questions, Put them in the comment section below after we finish this video and uh, we will see you next Wednesday. Have a great weekend.